Ladies and gentlemen, you're all very, very welcome today. My name is David Donoghue. Uh, we're delighted to have with us as uh, the guest of the Institute of International European Affairs, the president of the African Development Bank Group, uh, Dr. Akinwumi uh, Adesina, who will join me in a conversation on the role uh, of the African Development Bank uh, in realizing uh, economic opportunities for Africa. This is a, a very wide and, and, and fascinating subject. Uh, this is the third event in the 2022 Development Matters series, which is supported by Irish Aid. First, some housekeeping points. You'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you will see on your screen. Please feel free to send in your questions or comments as they occur to you throughout the session, and we will come to them at some point. Um, a reminder that today's session is on the record. Please feel free to join the discussion also on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. We are also live streaming the discussion, so a very warm welcome to all of you who are tuning in via YouTube. A word of introduction first about our distinguished guest, often described as Africa's optimist in chief, Dr. Akazina has been that Azina has been widely praised for his visionary leadership and uh, passion for the transformation of Africa. Since he took over as president of the AFDB in 2015, um, the bank has achieved the highest capital increase since its establishment in 1964. Ireland, uh, I should add, joined the uh, African Development Fund and the African Development Bank uh, as its 81st member uh, in 2020. I would now like to hand the floor to Paul Ryan, Director in the International Finance and Climate Division of our Department of Finance, who will deliver opening remarks. Paul, over to you, please. Thanks, David, and hello, President, and hello, uh, audience. Um, uh, as well as, as lauding the President as, as Africa's optim optimist chief, just like to also uh, say to him that he's Ireland's closest friend in the African Development Bank and the continent of Africa as well. He's been a, a fabulous um, partner for Ireland in, in the last couple of years, particularly when we joined in, in February of 2020. And uh, David, I think, is, is basically highlighted the capital increase, which, which is a very important thing for the, the bank and for the continent. But also, I think the response um, by the bank under the leadership of the president to COVID and now to the Ukrainian um, uh, war has been absolutely exemplary. Uh, a lot of um, future-proofing thinking has been done in relation to food security, renewable energy, um, economic development, and it's exactly um, in line with our development objectives. And we're very, very happy to join the bank, very pleased with the level of engagement, and really, really pleased at the work that the bank is doing in the continent. Um, the minister was, or the, the president was following the minister uh, for agriculture in Nigeria for four years, 2011 to 2015. Uh, he's a bold reformer, completely transformed the sector in uh, four years. He's done exactly the same in the bank as well too. First elected in, in May of 2015, and then unanimously re-elected for another five-year term in August of 2020. As I say, we're very happy with the president. Um, our fellow colleagues um, uh, in our constituency are very happy, and more importantly, the wider membership and the uh, continent of Africa are very happy. Delighted that he's here on his first official visit. It's his second visit uh, of his lifetime, and we've uh, invited him back as soon as he can to visit us in Ireland again. And uh, with no further ado, I'll leave the president now talk and um, uh, just to thank him again for coming. Thank you again for, for David and his colleagues for uh, arranging this event. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Paul. Uh, well, let me open our conversation, Dr. Adesina, by asking you just a, a, a couple of general questions about the, the work of the bank. Uh, I mean, obviously, there's a, a vast terrain of issues which we could and which I would love to be able to touch on in, in, in our conversation. You are responsible for having conceived the so-called high five priorities, the strategic priorities for the bank. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how you see these priorities helping African countries to uh, take forward the work of achieving the Sustainable Development Goals? Um, uh, I, I would have a particular interest in exploring that. Well, first and foremost, let me uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, David Donahue, and also thank Jill. It's great to see both of you again. Uh, thank you for having me uh, here at, uh, at, the, at the Institute. 
but also to uh, thank you and, and say how great pleasure it is to be together, of course, uh, uh, with, with, with Paul Ryan, who has done a fabulous job in, in helping us as we uh, got uh, Ireland uh, to join the African uh, Development Bank. And as one of you rightly said, you know, this is my first time of actually visiting Ireland um, as president of the African Development Bank. I came much earlier. Actually, you were at that time the um, the, the head of Irish aid when I came in the, in 2001 to the, about that time. And uh, Ireland was at that time discussing the whole issue of the uh, Millennium Development Goals and the issue of agriculture, nutrition, and so on. So it's good to be, uh, to be back. Uh, first is that I, am, I would like to first start by saying how appreciative I, uh, uh, I am of Ireland joining the African Development Bank. You know, Ireland joining the African Development Bank makes Ireland the 81st uh, shareholder country for, uh, uh, for the bank. And of course, um, Ireland joining the bank um, uh, for, for various reasons. You know, first and foremost is that, you know, I always feel Ireland um, is one of the countries that, that development from its heart and therefore uh, has a lot of respect for countries' uh, uh, situations and therefore uh, something that I really appreciate about, uh, about Ireland. And secondly, of course, is that Ireland, I want to say, is investing in the right institution. Um, you know, um, if you look at what we've done as a bank, um, you know, with um, uh, the, the high fives that you, you mentioned, uh, uh, David, at the bank, uh, I like five things. So the five things that we started off was, was called high fives, light up and power Africa, to feed Africa, to um, industrialize Africa, to integrate Africa, and to improve the quality of life of the people uh, of Africa. Well, it, it looks pretty simple, like you're doing high fives for everybody else, but in fact, they are very, very powerful. You know, the United Nations Development Program did an independent assessment. And they found out that, you know, if Africa were to achieve these high fives, it will have achieved 90% of the sustainable development goals. And if it achieved these high fives, it will have achieved 90% of the agenda 2063 of the African Union, which is the Africa we want. So in essence, David, the African Development Bank's high fives are the accelerators of Africa's development. Now, what has happened since we set this up? Um, you know, six years ago, when we started, um, in that period, you know, the work of the bank has impacted on the lives of 335 uh, million uh, uh, people. And um, if you look at some of the key issues, and we take, for example, the case of access to electricity, uh, we've been able to connect 21 million people uh, in terms of access to new electricity connections. Uh, you take a look at agriculture, for example, we've been able to get 79 million people with access to, I mean, 76 million people uh, with access to improve agricultural technologies for food security. Now, finance is very, very important. And so we do quite a lot of investments in investing companies on, the, on, on access to finance. And our work on that has improved the access to finance for 12 million people. Now, when you take off infrastructure, infrastructure is one of the big things the bank does. We've invested more than $40 billion on infrastructure in the last seven years alone. You know, so our work on transport, for example, has provided um, access to 69 million people in terms of access to improved transport services. And when you look at urbanization in Africa, the whole issue of water and sanitation is a very big issue. And, and our work has provided access to 50 million people uh, with access to improve water and sanitation in that short period of time. So in essence, you know, we're a bank that focuses on uh, making sure that we translate, it's not just about finance, but translating things into concrete impacts on the lives of people. And I think that's one of the things that Ireland, uh, participation with us as a shareholder is really excited about. The other part of it, of course, is uh, more institutional. You know, last year, the African Development Bank was ranked by uh, global finance as the best multilateral financial institution uh, in the world. You know, we have the concessional financing institution of the bank that is called the African Development Fund. You know, it was looked at by the Washington-based uh, Center for Global Development that found out that the African Development Fund that was ranked the second best concessional financing institution in the world, well ahead of all 49 concessional financing institutions in all 49 uh, developed countries, including all OECD countries. So we're pretty excited about that. And for me, the other thing that I get excited about is the importance of transparency 
Now, we were rated as the fourth most transparent institution in the world. So when you look at it in terms of programmatic, if you look at it institutionally, and in terms of relevance for Africa's development, I think um, Ireland picked its uh, spent in the right place. <laughs> I have no doubt. And uh, I must say, those are remarkable achievements, uh, indeed, in such a, a short space of time under, under your leadership. Obviously, right now, there are clouds on the, uh, on the horizon, I mean, big clouds, and uh, notably um, the impact of the Russia-Ukraine uh, uh, conflict. H how do you see uh, the, the repercussions of that conflict in terms of, the, uh, of, of food security in Africa, food, food access? What scale of crisis do you think is heading towards the continent? Well, first, you know, let me, let me, let me say that my heart, my, my mind and my prayers, thoughts and prayers are with the people of Ukraine. Um, you know, uh, when, I, when I turn on television and I see the level of destruction, the kind of just going on, it's just unacceptable. And, and I think first and foremost for me is uh, this has to stop, this war has to stop. You know, we, we, we have a common humanity here at stake. And so um, I really want to say that we must do all, use all means necessary to ensure that is, there, is, there, there is dialogue, there's conciliation, and we bring this war to an end. Now, having said that, you know, the war is happening so far, it seems for, for, from Africa actually physically, but in fact, it's not that far off uh, because Africa depends on Russia and Ukraine a lot. If you look at, you know, in terms of wheat, you know, both wheat uh, supply Ukraine and, and, and Russia and Ukraine supply 41% of Africa's wheat supply, right? And if there's no wheat, basically for many places, there's no food, right? And if you look at Ukraine, a small country though, but it supplies 31% um, of the maize supply uh, uh, imports for, for Africa. And you take, for example, in places like where you've worked before, you know, David, in, the, in East Africa, um, you know, over 90% of all their cereals comes from those two countries. So when the war, uh, Russia's war in Ukraine, um, um, uh, has significant impact, first is to look at how much uh, maize, or food was actually maize and soybean uh, and, and wheat coming in from those two countries. So this year, there will not be 30 million metric tons of both wheat and corn that's coming from Russia and, uh, and Ukraine will not be there. So you can imagine the, the impact that that will have in terms of food crisis, a potential food crisis, let me say. Second one, of course, is to look at the fertilizer side because um, you know, Africa will not be getting 2 million metric tons of fertilizer coming from both countries. Now, if those fertilizers don't come in, basically what I mean, David, is that uh, productivity on existing cultivated land in Africa will decline by anything between 20% and 50%. Right, so you have the one of food not coming in and you have the reduction in your productivity on existing land. So whichever way you look at both of those, those two things, uh, that, that confluence of those two factors will actually lead to a looming food crisis in Africa. But here is where um, we have been very, very quick to, to respond to this. I mean, when the COVID-19 situation happened, the bank was very, very you know, off, the, off the block. We responded very quickly and, and, and launched a $10 billion facility that supported up to $10 billion facility that supported the countries, including, in fact, by the way, David, uh, a $3 billion uh, uh, fight COVID-19 um, uh, social bond on the capital markets, global capital markets, which was at the time the, 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 the largest ever in world history. So we, we respond very fast. In this case, we did exactly the same thing. We launched a $1.5 billion um, African um, emergency food production plan to help Africa to produce and compensate for what is not gonna be getting from those countries. Now, these $1.5 billion uh, emergency food production facility will allow Africa to uh, produce 38 million metric tons of food, right? Over the next four seasons. So basically two years, four seasons. So that would provide technologies in the hands of 20 million uh, uh, farmers, climate resilient agricultural technologies. They will produce 38 million metric tons of food, but that's largely going to be uh, uh, wheat. That will be 11 million metric tons of wheat. You're looking at 18 million metric tons of corn. You're looking at 6 million metric tons of, um, uh, of rice and 2.5 million metric tons of soybeans. And that will be enough to mitigate any likely impact that this will have uh, on a looming food crisis in Africa. You know, when, when we have this, my view is that Africa doesn't need bowls in hand to go back for food. 
Africa needs seeds in the ground to produce food for itself. If there's anything that Africa should, in my view, add to solving global challenges, is it should fully unlock the potential of its agricultural sector and become a major food supplier to meet the, the, the food needs in the world. And so in the crisis also lies an opportunity uh, because, because you know, it's not the last time we're gonna have these kind of challenges, but Africa has today 65%, David, of all the uncultivated arable land left to feed 9 billion people in the world by 2050. And so what Africa does with food, with agriculture, is gonna determine the future of food in the world. So we do need to have a structural transformation of the agricultural sector in Africa. Now, one, what gives me this confidence that the, what I've explained to you is going to avoid a looming crisis. Let me just give you exa one, two examples. First is that we have a program that's called Technologies for African Agricultural Transformation, which we use to deliver technologies at the scale of millions of farmers. Three years ago, we started this program. It has delivered uh, technologies for over 12 million farmers, climate resilient technologies for 12 million farmers. Now, these, including among, including among that, is the issue of wheat. So you take, for example, Sudan, right? We provided Sudan um, with 65,000 uh, metric tons of heat-tolerant wheat varieties. Wheat, wheat is a temperate crop, as you know, but now we have heat-tolerant uh, wheat varieties. We gave those to Sudan. Now, to understand that, if you take an Airbus 380 aircraft, uh, uh, David, and you look at the, the, the total weight of it, uh, both the cargo, the, the passengers, and the fuel is 98.4 metric tons. So when I say 65,000 metric tons of certified seed or heat to run varieties, just imagine that like the equivalent of 666 A380 air buses on a landing strip. That's just to give you how it is. And yeah. um, in two years, Sudan reduced its wheat imports by 50%. Now, if you take, for example, um, uh, Ethiopia, uh, we did the same. We gave them 61,000 metric tons of certified seed of heat tolerant wheat varieties. They started planting this in 5,000 hectares in 2018. In 2019, 2020, um, they, 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 they went to over 167,000 hectares. Now they are in total at uh, 675,000 hectares. I was in um, Ethiopia. Uh, with Prime Minister uh, Abe Ahmed just two months ago. You know what he told me? He said, I can't. This year, we did not import a single grain of wheat. Next year, we will grow 2 million hectares on that is heat tolerant variety, which varieties. And we will become, for the first time in our history, a wheat exporting country to export 1.5 to 2 million metric tons of, uh, of, 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 of wheat to both uh, 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 Kenya and to Djibouti. So that's what I'm talking about. These are real things that are happening on the ground. So I am confident because our plan is based on what has been working. We'll have to take that to scale, but I think it's also an opportunity for us to finally, finally do what we should have done a long time ago, a real deep structural transformation to unlock the full potential of Africa's agriculture. Well, as you say, in, in, in every crisis, there is an opportunity and that, that's really a, a remarkable uh, um, story um, and the, 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 the potential to use the current crisis uh, with Russia and Ukraine to achieve real transformation, as, as you were saying, uh, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. And I have no doubt that Ireland um, would, would, would hope to be able to assist and, and, and work with you uh, in, 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 in that area. Um, it's obviously something of great interest to us, the, uh, the, the, the uh, application of uh, technology to agricultural transformation. Um, but uh, no, you, you start to give a very, very encouraging uh, uh, picture of what may be possible, what could arise out of this. You, you touched a moment ago on um, what the bank did in response to COVID-19 um, and the facility which you set up then, um, which in itself was a, was a, a, a terrific initiative. What results did, did you feel you achieved with that particular initiative, as I say, in the, in the COVID-19 uh, context? Uh, did you, I mean, was you, is it your assessment that that has made a, a significant impact on uh, access to health, on resilience of health systems? What, what was your sense of the, the, uh, the achievement with that facility? 
Oh, well, thanks. You know, they, they, it, it, clearly, you know, when, when COVID-19 actually hit, it was a real eye-opener for me because Africa did not have even basic gloves. They didn't have access to personal protective equipment. They did not have access to testing kits. They did not even have access to laboratories. There was only one or two in Africa that could actually test for things. And if you look at the number of ICU beds uh, that were there, it was very, very, very little. So Africa was totally, totally unprepared uh, when COVID-19 actually hit the country. Now, but that beat, beat as it may, we, we actually responded. As I said, we provided um, a, a crisis response facility that, you know, up to $10 billion to support countries. Basically, the, these were fast disbursing loans because the countries were not interested in projects. Everybody was interested more in, these are existential risks. And so countries were more interested in how to shore up their population and assure our security for good reason. And so, we, we were able to use this facility to do maybe three, four things. First is rapidly build up the uh, capacity of the technical, the medical staff that they have, both the technicians in terms of also the medical doctors that will actually uh, work out across countries. Um, a second is the number of ICU beds uh, that, um, in the ICU units with beds that in many, many hospitals went up dramatically because of the uh, investment that we made. Now, in terms of testing, um, because a lot of the money also went to support countries to, to develop capacity for testing. I think way over uh, 26 million uh, uh, people are able to be tested because of, uh, of, that, of, of, of all of that uh, uh, support. But if there's anything that all of this actually also did was it actually helped to reduce the, uh, the fiscal burdens on the countries because many of the countries then were facing potential a high risk of their distress. So it actually helped them to expand their fiscal space uh, that they badly needed in the midst of this crisis. But the issue is, what next? We don't know what's gonna be across the corner again. There could be another crisis just looking across the corner. Now, my view is that we must, Africa must learn some deep lessons from this crisis and must basically say, in my view, um, have what I call health security defense system, you know, so that you're not, you're not caught unprepared. And this health defense system must have three uh, areas. One is to build Africa's pharmaceutical capacity, manufacturing capacity. The second is to build Africa's vaccine manufacturing capacity. And third is to build what you were saying, the whole issue of quality healthcare infrastructure. Now, these areas are fundamental to, to create a defense system in health, just like national security for African countries. Now, the African Development Bank is working on all three fronts at this right now. So you take, for example, the pharmaceutical area. You know, Africa imports about 70, 80% of all its uh, 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 drugs and medicines and so on. You know, it, it doesn't make any sense. And so we, we've committed to spend $3 billion over the next 10 years in helping to revamp Africa's pharmaceutical uh, uh, industries. And, um, uh, and, and, and linked to that is the issue of vaccines uh, 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 production. And um, secondly is our board of governors, our directors actually, approved um, for us a quality healthcare strategy for Africa. So the bank will be investing a lot in primary healthcare infrastructure, secondary healthcare infrastructure and tertiary healthcare infrastructure. Our comparative advantage is in the area of infrastructure. So we will basically be in those, in those, uh, in, in those areas. And finally, just last week, uh, our board of directors approved the um, establishment of what we call Africa Pharmaceutical Technology Foundation, which is a new brand new institution that is gonna help Africa to access um, the, the, the proprietary technologies that it needs, the know-hows that it needs, uh, the knowledge of the processes to be able to manufacture vaccines, not only for COVID, but also to uh, other uh, diseases in Africa. So basically to deal with the issue of how you take IP protected and patent protected technologies and processes and, 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 and materials and make those available for Africans uh, uh, pharmaceutical uh, industries. So we have learned from that process. Yes, we, we helped, but we are now making sure that the building blocks to make sure that Africa is in um, 
a situation to effectively respond to any exogenous health shock is better bolstered. It was certainly um, equipping Africa with um, capacity to respond to future shocks is absolutely vital and, and, and the bank is doing uh, wonderful work there. You mentioned yesterday, I think, in, in, in another uh, context, that only 16% of Africans were, were vac- have been vaccinated, which is a very stark figure. And, and obviously, we, were, we here were all struck by the deep injustice of the, the vaccine inequity. But what, I mean, what sort of objectives do you have in mind in terms of building vaccination capacity? I'm just curious to know, have you set yourselves uh, with the foundation and otherwise, have you set yourselves targets for the level of vaccination that could be achieved over the coming years? Yeah, you know, I mean, the, the, the low level of vaccination that you have, you know, the, the 16%, which is very, very low. If you look at developed countries, they are 80% and, uh, and above, you know. And the reasons for that is actually several, you know, and that's what we have to make sure we, we fix with the, the, the foundation going forward. First, that the vaccines came very, very late. Secondly, the vaccines that were provided, quite a lot of them were about to expire. So you couldn't really, uh, uh, really, really use them. And third is was that the information on vaccines also, um, there was a lot of, in many places, vaccine hesitancy because people were actually not very sure of how safe and effective the, 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 uh, the vaccines were. Uh, but of course, also it's a very high cost of vaccines. So when you're looking at a situation where developed countries bought up literally all the vaccines three times what they ever needed, right? That wasn't enough actually for Africa. Africa was at the bottom um, of, the, of the pile. Uh, 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 on this. Now, however, when you take a look at what we need to do to, to, to improve that going forward, you know, in the past, everybody used to think that COVAX was going to be the way to deal with things. So you bought by, you, you, you actually then reduce the price in which you got access to, 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 to drugs and to, and to, I mean, I mean to, 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 to vaccines, you know, and that because of market failure, um, in, in, in Africa, smallness of the markets, the, the, the lack of finance and lack of skills and lack of good infrastructure, that probably Africa shouldn't have been, uh, shouldn't be investing a lot more in this particular area. But, you know, COVAX wasn't able to deliver for Africa uh, when it needed it. And secondly, Africa learned from the fact that, you know, it cannot outsource the, the health security or it shouldn't of its 1.3 billion people to the benevolence of others, you know, and that was a lesson that we learned from that. So what we're really talking about here now in Africa is that Africa produces vaccines, only 1% of the total amount of vaccine that it produces. If you look at it, David, you know, 135 years of work on vaccines, right? Africa, apart from the Institute of Pasteur, right? In, in Senegal, which is doing the, uh, the yellow fever vaccine, the only one, Africa doesn't have any vaccines. And so part of the problem is technology, yes. But it goes more than technology is the technology know-how. It is having the R&D ecosystem that can support the, 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 the processes, the understanding the processes of how you actually uh, manufacture vaccines because it's not something you take off the shelf in a, super, in a supermarket, right? And, and part of the reasons why it's very difficult for African countries is that many of these things are protected on that it trips uh, trade-related intellectual property rights. They couldn't get access to that um, but also because of the patents and copyrights on many of these things, which actually limits uh, market entry, I mean, or raises the market entry costs for many of the African pharmaceutical companies. So what the foundation, the Africa Pharmaceutical Technology Foundation, which we are setting up will do, is to try and deal with this particular uh, issue. First is to try and deal with the structural barrier in terms of actually being able to know which technologies exist. Which platforms should you use? When should you use it? And how viable will the platforms be? So it's not just a technology, but which platform is it? So that's a structural issue on which technologies. The other one, of course, is to look at um, how to ensure that the African pharmaceutical companies can search for, they can transact and acquire intellectual property related uh, technologies and know how that will allow them to be able to, to, to develop 
uh, uh, vaccines today and for several other things. You know, it's like it's like Coca Cola. Coca Cola is based in Atlanta, Georgia. You know, they send it to, to to you wherever you are in the world, but you can't change the formulation. So you just have to, you know, you you, you pour water, you pour gas, and and that's it. It's the same also with vaccines. So a lot of what's been done in Africa is fill and finish, you know, but the knowledge of the technology and the processes, uh, it's important. And the other structural barrier that I think is needed that the foundation will try to help to deal with is also how to create the critical linkages between the R&D systems in the universities and the industry. You know, anywhere in the world where you've had vaccines uh, in, in developed countries, it's always been because there is a core development a cooperation between university R&D systems and the private sector. So the foundation that we are talking about, we also help to deal with uh, this particular issue. So it's not just about, well, here are companies that are coming to Africa, they are producing vaccines for you. Well, it's not somewhat different from Coca-Cola sending me uh, a, a, a Coca-Cola Coca -Cola to fill, but we want to move beyond that and be able to master the processes, the knowledge, the know-how, that allows Africa to produce vaccines for its own um, epidemiological profile. No, that's an extremely exciting workload. I mean, you could imagine potentially uh, a vast amount of resources going into it. I, I mean, I think the the, um, the the trips aspect is particularly interesting to me that that you'll find some way of of, of easing access to the market for. Uh, for, for the, the companies involved. Um, uh, I mean, will, will this become a major priority for the bank over the next few years? It, it, what you've described there really, it, because it is so comprehensive, it, 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 it should really help to, to uh, move things forward in relation to pharmaceutical production. I think you're, you're muted. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Yes. Yeah. No, I imagine that it, it will. The foundation will become one of your top priorities from the way in which you have described the the the, the, the work it will be undertaking. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the the thing for us as a, as a bank, Africa as a development bank, is when all these conversations started. Well, you know, there there, there are there's movement in terms of translocation of production capacities into Africa. Uh, by, by some of the companies like whether it's um, uh, uh, Moderna or Johnson & Johnson or, or, or whether it is um, the, the, those that are now moving into uh, 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 Rwanda, you know, but, but at the end of the day, it goes beyond just simply that technology uh, transfer. And so we, we're working closely, we're gonna be working very closely on this with WTO uh, with um, uh, the Director General of WTO, um, myself, and also Director General uh, Tedro of the World Health Organization are working very, very closely on this particular issue. And to your point on the WTO TRIPS, uh, trade-related intellectual property rights, you know, the, 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 actually the TRIPS, the, the trade-related intellectual property rights allows for the um, giving both exclusive and non-exclusive licenses to, to, to developing countries up to actually, I think, July 1st of 2034. But the issue is, even if that exists, it's always existed, but it's never really worked because of the IP protection and the inability to, to negotiate, right? With the holders of the IPs to release that to you. So yes, it's going to be a very major area for us because we think the problems in Africa and this area it's not just about producing something today, but dealing with some of the fundamental structural reasons why Africa is not able, has not been able to access uh, the IP protected technologies and know-how. And you take a look at India, you take a look at Brazil, you take a look at, at Bangladesh, uh, you know, they've been able to do this very well. So we're trying to use this foundation to tilt think, you know, access to IP, um, related technologies uh, mm. in favor of Africa. And if I might just add something here to, to, to give you know, uh, some of the colleague, people listening a, a context on this. You know, when I was in Rockefeller Foundation in the 90s, we had on agriculture a similar problem, um, which was actually going to devastate all the cassavas and all the bananas of Africa, because they were being really devastated by viruses, right? 
you had cassava mosaic virus and that was going to blow out all the cassava and the, uh, and, the, and the banana bacteria wilt that was going to finish up all the bananas of Africa. It was going to cause a crisis. Now, one thing that the, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation did at the time was to actually work with others to create what is called the African Agricultural Technology Foundation, AATF, which is based in Nairobi, Kenya. And we staffed it with IP lawyers from the top to the bottom for them to develop um, materials exchange agreements with the holders of the IPs globally because they wanted to release it, but they didn't find a platform that was trustworthy, that was transparent, that was accountable, that they could release this to the make sure it doesn't get in the thought of third, third party countries. So that was done. And what happened, David? All of a sudden, all the uh, IP protected materials and genes and so on were released for Africa. And we used that mm. to, to develop the, the, the resistant varieties for cassava and for bananas and voila, we saved all of Africa from that. It's the same thing now. People need a very transparent, trustworthy intermediation agency that can actually do, do this on behalf of Africa. And we think that is what the African Technology Pharmaceutical Technology Foundation mm -hmm. will do uh, for Africa on the pharmaceutical side. No, that's wonderful. Um, Dr. Adesina, we might just turn to one of the many other things which the bank is doing, and that is the, the action you're taking in response to, to climate change and the support that you provide countries with uh, in, in, in combating climate change. Francis Jacobs, who's a former a member of the Institute, a former European Parliament official, he asks, uh, how, how, does, how does it work, for example, with countries in the Sahel, which have internal political insecurity and might have difficulties in making the best use of the financing that the, the bank provides? But if you could tell us a little bit about your, your, the, the climate work that, and, 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 and take up Francis' question, that would be great. Okay, now let me let me talk first on the on the climate side. You know, I mean, climate change is is a real problem for Africa. You know, Africa doesn't contribute for more than you know four uh, percent of uh, of the carbon emissions in the world, but suffers disproportionately from the negative consequences of it. You have on the continent today in Africa, we lose anything between seven and fifteen billion dollars a year in terms of losses to climate change. Now, if nothing changes going forward, that's going to rise to fifty billion dollars a year by 2030. So that's really going to be almost 7% of Africa's GDP going into that. So it's a massive problem that it has created. Now, the issue is Africa needs to adapt to climate change. Right? So a lot of focus has to be on climate adaptation. And that's where our priority is. As a bank today, we have doubled our climate finance uh, to reach $25 billion by 2025. Now, a big chunk of that is actually focused on climate adaptation. You know, UN Secretary General Antony Guterres said that, you know, the world institutions, which are all focus on 50-50 uh, in terms of adaptation and climate mitigation. Well, we've gone beyond 50% as African Development Bank. We are at 67% mm -hmm. of all our climate finance devoted to climate adaptation, which is Africa's challenge. So which is the highest of any multilateral financial institution you will find in the world. I was very delighted when the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres listed the African Development Bank as a leader globally on this on climate adaptation and said, others oh, you follow. So we'll continue to work on climate adaptation. Now we also are working very closely with the uh, 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 Global Center on Adaptation, uh, which is chaired by the former UN Secretary General uh, uh, Ban Ki-moon and has a fantastic uh, 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 CEO, uh, Professor uh, Patrick Bakurjan uh, from, from Netherlands. And we are mobilizing an additional $25 billion for climate adaptation um, in, uh, in Africa. So all of that to say that we're helping Africa to adapt to, uh, to, uh, to climate change. Now, when I take a look at the issue of the, 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 the Sahel, uh, well, one more thing before I move to the Sahel, one of the things, of course, that you find, uh, David, in Africa is you have frequencies of drought, you have floods, you have cyclones, you have all of this. this. The issue is how do countries you know, essentially um, ensure themselves against this extreme weather pattern of states of nature. And what we have is we have something called the African um, Disaster Risk Insurance Facility. Now this mm -hmm. Africa Disaster Risk Insurance Facility essentially ensures countries against this catastrophic risk event. So if they happen, you can get a payout on it. We work with the Africa Risk Capacity, which is based in, in, in uh, an arm of the African Union based in, in South Africa. And it works so well. I mean, take for example, 
the case of Madagascar. Madagascar was devastated recently by the, uh, the, uh, the, the cyclone Bistri, um, which left the whole place devastated. And we had paid about $4 million to insure the country against this uh, uh, event. And when it happened, they got a payout from the Africa risk capacity of $12 million. And that $12 million uh, allowed them to be able to support uh, roughly 600,000 farmers uh, that were in impacted by that. So we do need resources to scale these kind of things up because they're more frequent than others, uh, more often. Now on the question that was raised um, in, the, uh, in the Sahel, you know, it, I, I guess the question is how do we walk in the Sahel? Is that, is that what the question was? Yeah. Right? right. That's right, yeah. Well, you know, the, the, the Sahel, uh, for, three things I want to say about the Sahel. You know, first is that Sahel needs um, electricity. Um, you know, and as you know, China faces a challenge with regard to uh, the issue of also um, insecurity, which is one thing. And the other thing, of course, is desertification. So if you take a look at the issue of access to electricity in the Sahel, um, the bank is implementing what is called desert to power, turning these deserts, harnessing the power of the sun to provide them electricity. It's a $20 billion program that we are working on. Uh, we're working on it together with the Agence Francais de Développement uh, in France, um, who's put together 100 million euros support for it. Uh, we have Rockefeller Foundation that's committed 100 million dollars towards that. We have the um, the Global Environment and, uh, and the Green Climate Fund that has just put in 150 million dollars towards that effort. The Swedish government has put in 20 million uh, um, uh, euros in support of that initiative, and the bank is putting well over 400 million dollars uh, to our Sustainable Energy Fund for Africa into that. Well, what will the Desert to Power do? Not just for the Sahelian countries, but for all the countries that share the Sahelian band in Africa, all the way to Djibouti, all the way to Northern Ethiopia. What will it do? It will provide electricity, 10,000 megawatts of electricity. It's the capacity we want to build via solar. And that will provide electricity for 250 million people both grid-based and off-grid-based system. And when it is completed, it will be the largest solar zone in the world. Now, we have started this already. We've started already in Chad. Uh, we was called Jamea uh, Solar Power. Uh, we have also started in Burkina Faso. It's called Project Yellen on solar. We've also yeah. started in Mali, which is called uh, Segu uh, 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 Solar. So this is what we are doing because I think we need to light up the the Sahel. Terrorists always lack dark places. There's no electricity, they just have a field day. So the first thing is make sure they get electricity. The second yeah. thing is when you look at the issue of insecurity. Unfortunately, insecurity has increased significantly across the Sahel, as you know. Now, they are spending so much of their monies on security investments and a lot less of their money on development financing for education, for health, for water, for sanitation what you and I and others care about in terms of development. So that substitution is happening. Now the key really is this. How do we make sure that they have the resources to cope with this? Because that's the problem. You know, I mean, the president of Burkina Faso was removed by the military because he couldn't pay for food uh, for his military in the, in the north of the country. And so I think basically what I'm saying, David, is that we have to now make a link between security between growth, between security linking it to investment, to growth and development. We can't look at security anymore as an exogenous factor in that development process. We've got to integrate it as an endogenous part of that. And to deal with that and help the countries to have more resources to cope with this issues of insecurity that is now becoming a contagion effect in many countries with spillover effects. The African Development Bank is de developing what's called security index investment bonds. And, and these security index investment bonds will be new instruments that we will launch on the capital markets that will allow these countries of the Sahel and others to do four things. First is to build up their, uh, the, their defense architecture. I don't mean guns, I don't mean APCs or anything like that, but just your intelligence, your capa human capacity, uh, your ICT systems and so on, surveillance systems, which is very important. And second is to rebuild damaged infrastructure in areas of conflict. 
Third is to rebuild social infrastructure, water, health, education, you know, um, in areas that have been devastated, because if you don't have those, then you've lost the battle of the mind and soul of the population. And the last one is to also protect areas where you have strategic investments from terrorists and others uh, doing that. So we are trying to do that to support them to be more stable economies. And lastly is the whole issue of the climate, you know, and, and you know, the, the issue of uh, desertification is a big problem in the Sahel. And that's why I really want to applaud the work that's been led by um, the, you know, President Macron um, in France and also with um, the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres and my sister, Amina Mohammed, uh, there on the Great Green Wall. Because the Great Green Wall is the, is the, is the, is, is the buffer to, to protect the, the Sahel from desertification. And the African Development Bank is a champion of that. And we committed $6.5 billion towards that great green wall. So at the end of the day, all I'm saying is, we've got to help the Sahelian economies to be more stable climate-wise, reduce the certification, but also make sure that they have more resources to, to cope with the issues of it, rising uh, uh, in, uh, uh, expenditures that are making on the military, which is actually reducing and displacing, let me say, the financing going to development. That's a, thank you very much for that. Um, uh, I'm, I mean, there were many, many interesting things in, in what you said there, in particular, uh, the, the way in which the bank is directly addressing the, the security dimension in, in, in uh, facing countries in the Sahel, uh, that you're not, as it were, uh, bypassing it, but you, you see it as a, um, a challenge which must be addressed head on uh, through, for example, the security bonds and so on. I, I, I find that a, a fascinating approach. Um, the, and the, the, the great green wall, obviously, is it, 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 it's very good to hear that uh, the bank is also invested in that. We have perhaps time for two or three final questions. Um, let me just put one to you uh, relating to the energy needs of the continent and how the um, uh, how the bank is uh, is trying to address those, and then maybe a word about infrastructure. Uh, perhaps if I could just ask you to to um, uh, give your perspective on those two issues, and then we might have we might have time for one one final wrap up question. Okay. Well, thank you. You know, the, the, the you know electricity is the life is the life blood of any any society. You know, it's like blood in your body. If you have blood, you're alive. If you don't have blood, you're not alive. And so, any economy without electricity is not a living economy. It's not a dynamic economy. It's not one that can create job or industrialize and things like that. Be competitive. And that's why Light Up and Power Africa is a, is a major, uh, you know, a top priority for us uh, um, in, in Africa. So what are we doing in, in, in this particular area? First, you know, a couple of points. The first is that we are focusing on renewable energy. Uh, today, um, you know, 83, 84% of all of our investment in energy in Africa is focused on renewable energy. So for example, we actually helped to finance the no Wazazate, which is the world's largest concentrated solar power plant, which is 510 megawatts, which is based in Morocco. The second one is we did the 310 uh, megawatts, which is um, in um, uh, uh, Lake Tukana project, which is in, in, in Kenya, which is the largest um, wind power plant uh, in Africa. I mentioned to you the desert of power that we're doing a $20 billion investment in the Sahel and countries to, uh, to provide electricity. But we are also investing in geothermal. So geothermal, for example, in the area that you know where in Kenya, in the Rift Valley area, that geothermal now supplies more than 60% of the electricity of, uh, of Kenya. We are also investing in hydro. So basically, but as we look at energy, with all of that that I've just mentioned to you, we must also realize that three things are fundamentally important. One is access. Second is affordability. And third is, is security and stability of supply. So for Africa, Yes, we're doing all we can on the renewable side, but there are limits to what renewable alone can do because of the intermittency of the power supply. And so for Africa, natural gas is and must remain a fundamental part of the energy mix of Africa. What you need is an energy mix. By actually doing that, we ensure that we actually have a stable uh, grid system that can allow us to take advantage of the maximum we can out of renewable energy. And you can see also the other part of it is uh, dealing with the issue of uh, energy transition, uh, the just energy transition. The African Development Bank is at the forefront of that for Africa, because fundamentally, 
what we're doing is we are establishing at the bank a just energy transition facility, which will warehouse uh, the heavy fuel oil power plants in Africa, the coal-based uh, 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 um, power plants in Africa, and transition them to much more greed-based, uh, renewable energy-based uh, that are less polluting uh, for the environment. And, and if I might just give an example, uh, now we are working with the G7, and I want to applaud the G7 for their leadership in trying to provide um, um, $8.5 billion to the government of South Africa, you know, that wants to get out of um, uh, President Ramaphosa on the issue of coal uh, moving to a much more renewable energy based system. However, you know, what South Africa needs is not $8.5 billion. What South Africa needs is $40 billion. So, how do you get $8.5 billion to become $40 billion is the big question. So that is where the African Development Bank came in again very innovatively. We developed a new financial business model, investment model, that will allow us working together with the G7 on their grants, on their concessions, and also on guarantees to turn that $8.7 billion into $40 billion, which is what South Africa will need in hand to be able to actually do a just energy transition properly. And I must add, we, the model that we, the, the business model we have will allow South Africa to raise all that money without incurring debt at all. Mm, and so great. I'm really in the present Ramaphosa is very pleased with the war we have. So does the government. So we're working very closely, the government of South Africa and of course with the G7 on this. These are two major issues that I wanted to say on the issue um, uh, uh, of, of energy. Great. Infrastructure, have you, could you just tell us very, very quickly what your priorities are there? Um, uh, I mean, the, the work which the bank is doing to support the creation of infrastructure and indeed, what are your thoughts on the, on the Chinese uh, dimension? Well, you know, infrastructure, you know, it's like, um, I like to look at, it's like a, your vertebrae column, right? So vertebrae column, you know, if you have one, you stand straight. If you don't have it, but if you you can't stand straight. That's what infrastructure is to economies, right? And, um, and so, you know, infrastructure is one of the big areas of the bank. In fact, we have a great competitive advantage in that. You know, in the last um, seven years, we've invested, um, you know, in infrastructure, well over $40 uh, billion on infrastructure. And I just saw a, uh, I think I looked about a study a few uh, weeks ago, uh, that was done by Center for Global Development in, in, in the United States. But I actually found that, you know, our investment uh, on infrastructure in Africa is over, you know, four times what the World Bank is doing on infrastructure in Africa. Uh, over 2.5 you know, times uh, what the IFC, International Finance Corporation, is doing on infrastructure in Africa. Mm -hmm. That's because we focus a lot on infrastructure. And that infrastructure includes, for example, you know, road transport corridors, energy infrastructure, digital infrastructure, but also water and sanitation to cope with rapidly urbanizing societies like we have um, in, uh, uh, in Africa. And, you know, including energy transmission infrastructure. So if I can give you one or two key infrastructure that is actually transforming the continent. Take, for example, the, the transport corridor that is linking Ethiopia, Addis Ababa to Nairobi. And so it provides, uh, it's a $1.1 .1 billion investment by the bank over 1,100 kilometers. And it's almost completed. When it's completed, David, it will allow trade between Ethiopia and Kenya to rise by 400%. You take, for example, another type of infrastructure, which is very, very important, which is port infrastructure. You look at the Welby's Bay port in Namibia, for example, we put about $380 million uh, into that. And that will reduce uh, the cost of accessing port for the landlocked countries, Malawi, Zimbabwe, and, and Zambia and all that, you know, that are gonna use that port because of the increased capacity of the, of the port. Digital economy is where we are today. And so you do need to have digital infrastructure. So the bank has invest, invested a lot in this digital infrastructure, submarine cables in East Africa and Central Africa, and the Trans-Sahara submarine network to link us all the way to North Africa and then into Europe, which is very, very important for all the things, digital services that one is talking about uh, today. And if I may also add one thing is just at the Africa Investment Forum that we had um, just this year, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, 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 the big corridor that's supposed to link Lagos 
to, um, uh, to, to Abidjan, going through Benin and going to uh, 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 Accra and all the way to Abidjan and of course, eventually up to Senegal. We were able to raise um, roughly $15.6 billion of investment commitment from investors towards that project that will be landmark in the region. So there are many, many types of infrastructure that we are doing. But three things I want to say on infrastructure. First is that as we do infrastructure, we must recognize that governments alone cannot and should not do infrastructure. Because if, if, if governments get debt, and the debt is, if you look at a lot of the debt Africa has today, it's, it's quite a lot of it is, is infrastructure related debt. Okay, but if government is putting all of that in its own books, uh, that's not necessarily good. So we believe that it's time to do a lot more public private partnerships on infrastructure to make sure that we reduce the debt overhang that comes from infrastructure. Secondly, is the importance of also making sure that infrastructure is quality infrastructure, not just any kind of infrastructure. So we have had a lot of the G20 principles on quality infrastructure, because uh, you have to look at the life cycle, life cycle costs and maintenance costs of infrastructure, quality infrastructure. And that's why an environmentally climate resilient infrastructure. And that's why the African Development Bank ourselves Africa 50, the European Investment Bank, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, uh, and, a, and several other agencies are launching, and with the Agence Conseil de Development in France, well, we are launching what is called the uh, Alliance for Green Infrastructure in Africa to allow Africa to raise a lot of uh, green bonds uh, to, to finance green climate resilient uh, infrastructure. And the last thing I want to say on infrastructure which is particularly important is that if there is one type of infrastructure that I don't like and I will never subscribe to, it's infrastructure that is built with natural resources back in the loans, right? Mm -hmm. That's very, very bad type of loans. You cannot mortgage your future just because you want to get something in the, in the immediate. And so we must make sure that investments on infrastructure are done transparently uh, and, and done in a way that does not undermine the long-term uh, uh, financial viability of, uh, of countries. You know, people can talk, people talk about, you asked me a question about China. China does a lot of investments on, on, on infrastructure uh, in Africa. But I do want to say that the, the issue you find in, uh, in Africa is that Africa just basically needs infrastructure and it needs quality infrastructure. What I think we need to do, regardless of where the finance is coming, is agree on a number of common principles. First is that we must agree that there must be quality infrastructure. Two, we must agree that we must not let infrastructure lead to increased dead bodies for countries. We must also make sure that we also do local currency financing of infrastructure. Because if you do a road, transport corridors, and your, or energy and your, your revenue streams are in local currency, or you're paying for it with expensive foreign debt, well, there's a currency mismatch problem there. And so we want to make sure we do a lot more on local currency financing. And finally, it's the fact that, look, Africa has today, David, $2 trillion of assets under management, sitting with pension funds and sovereign wealth funds. Well, all these monies are being invested outside the country in money market instruments in which they are earning negative real rate of return. Well, look, if you're a pension fund and you are investing outside in those things, Pension funds are supposed to give you annuity so that you can come back and have a great retirement. Well, if you come back and there's no road, there's no port, there's no hospital, there's not, that's a miserable retirement. And so I think that the pension funds of Africa and the, 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 the sovereign wealth funds should be looking at infrastructure in Africa as an asset class and therefore yes. be investing significantly in that. So mobilizing yes. private capital for infrastructure it's very important. And my last word on infrastructure is we've got to be able to prepare bankable projects because the, the, the problem is not the money, it's actually having a lot of bankable projects. And that's why the African Development Bank helped the establishment of Africa 50 as a, uh, a vehicle that actually deploys private instruments to actually do commercially viable uh, infrastructure for Africa. We need to prepare bankable projects. We have at the bank something yeah. called the, uh, the NEPAD Infrastructure Preparation Facility, where we put in $18 million just to develop projects for Africa on infrastructure. 
But you know what it has led to? $26 billion downstream of infrastructure investments. So it actually makes a lot of sense to do that. And so at the yeah. end of the day, this is how we are going to do uh, Africa's development so we can take advantage of the Africa continental free trade area, which is going to be sense. the second largest in the world. But you can't trade if you can't get from one place to the other. Absolutely. And that's our job as African development. Well, very reluctantly, Dr. Ambazina, we're going to have to let you go to your next appointment. We could have talked a lot longer. There are many, many uh, interesting subjects. And thank you for the the uh, fantastic answers you gave to those really big questions. Um, much food for thought. On behalf of everybody who has been listening in, we thank you warmly for having come, having taken the time from your, your very busy schedule. We profited from it enormously. Thank you so much. Very best of luck with the future work of the bank, and it's obviously in great hands. And um, uh, thank you for everything you, you told us today. Thank you we'll so much. You again thank you, Jill. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Thanks, Ryan. Bye. Thank you.